Our first speaker in the 14th Annual Philosophy Department Symposium on the Self and Contemporary Psychoanalysis is Dr. Larry Hedges. Dr. Hedges is in private practice in Newport Beach as a psychotherapist. His orientation is psychoanalytically uh, inclined, and he has recently published a book called Listening per Perspectives in Psychotherapy. In the book, Dr. Hedges surveys four different, uh, as he puts it, listening perspectives in psychoanalytic psychotherapy, and uh, he will be telling us about those perspectives today. The perspectives, in brief, review the uh, personality and developmental task appropriate to the so-called neurotic personality, to the so-called narcissistic personality, to the borderline, uh, borderline personality, and to what uh, Dr. Hedges calls the organizing personality, sometimes what is called the psychotic. And in reviewing these four different uh, types of personality organization, Dr. Hedges will be telling us about the listening perspectives that he believes a psychotherapist must utilize and must be able to move comfortably between in a clinical hour. So without further ado, let's hear Dr. Larry Hedges on contemporary perspectives in psychoanalysis. I didn't know quite where to start today because I know many of you have different backgrounds, some of you have different uh, understandings of the self, so let me just kind of ramble on uh, a bit. Um, when we try to deal with a concept like the self, we're always at a loss to know exactly what we mean. So let me give you a bit of a, a history on some of the ways that people have, have used this term and the way that it's evolved over the last hundred years. I think Freud was particularly interested in uh, uh, a certain view of it, and we'll continue to talk about Freud this weekend, but I think that perhaps for our, uh, our broader perspective, certainly philosophers have been dealing with this problem for several thousand years at least, and I think during the last two or three hundred, there's been an intensification of whatever it is we mean by the sense of self, the sense of I. I think we have to realize that the sense of self, the sense of I, um, in uh, psychoanalyse, the ego, if you will, uh, is, is a concept or a sense that exists in certain places of history, um, in certain cultural milieus. And I think uh, it's reached its peak in the last two to three hundred years in Western civilization uh, as an idea. It's hard for us to believe because it's sort of like we just assume that uh, we all have a self that we carry around, some, a little homunculus inside, uh, that we call me, myself, and I, and it's hard for us to grasp that that, that is not always so. In many places in the world today, it, it, such notions are not conceivable. And to realize that we're really talking about a very specialized intellectual and cultural notion when we talk about the, uh, the self. So we're going to be dealing with that the entire week about how different people have looked at it. Um, we know from our studies of uh, Descartes that as he began to define uh, the I, there was a heavy emphasis upon uh, thought, ideas. Uh, when Rousseau came along, there was a heavy emphasis on uh, trying to specify in the sense of I, the sense of self, the sense of me, uh, feelings, uh, emotions. When Freud began his studies, he started in a way that was somewhat different than um, everyone else. He started with a sense of I, first of all, uh, as I am a hysteric. That is, I as a patient. Now let's go back for some of you and uh, uh, just review how psychoanalysis got off the ground because it had sort of a peculiar beginning. Freud, as you know, was a neurologist. Um, and in the uh, 1880s, he became interested, like most neurologists, in uh, um, all, many institutionalized persons, and in 1885, um, 86, in that winter, he went to Paris to study with Charcot uh, hypnosis. Freud was uh, astounded, as were many other people at the time, that a person with severe hysteria, hysterical uh, crippling, hysterical blindness, and so forth, could, with the help of hypnosis and in the hypnotic state, relinquish the so-called hysterical symptoms which meant to neurologists that hysteria needed to be reconceptualized not as it had been, as a degenerative disease, that, is of, uh, that it was a genetic or a moral degeneration, 
uh, with presumably a biological basis, but that hysteria needed to be conceptualized as a psychological state. We know then in Freud's early studies with Breuer uh, in the early 1890s, uh, they were finally published as a series of, of uh, case studies, uh, that the, the problem of the um, I, the self, uh, the ongoing organization of each of these hysterics was studied by Freud uh, and Breuer. By 1895, in Freud's uh, Project for Scientific Psychology, he formed his first theory, uh, psychological theory, of the mind. Now, it's cast in physiological terms, and we, we go back to read it, we're somewhat confused because he's talking about neurons, uh, quantities of uh, flow in a neuronal system, but he actually calls the system the psychic system, which later becomes uh, abbreviated to the psi system. Freud revised his theory in his interpretation of dreams in 1900, um, and I guess in, a, in some papers and books that I'm working up now, I'm going to be particularly interested in what was lost between 1895 and 1900 in Freud's early theories of the mind. Uh, now our press is picking up uh, the work of uh, Jeff Masson. Uh, you've been reading about that either in the New Yorker or the Atlantic Time magazine. He has a book that was just published uh, scandalizing somewhat this early period, uh, feeling that Freud gave up some things on the basis of perhaps some intellectual dishonesty. Um, I'm not certain that that's true, but the, the thesis that I will be pursuing myself is there was something lost in this early period. And what was it? Um, and I think as we go back and try to look at why something was lost, um, I think to me, the explanation is basically that uh, Freud, like any other investigator, um, in his uh, early studies, was considering the entire universe uh, and the entire problem of man. And then as he progressively refined and limited his studies, he began to limit it increasingly to one particular aspect that, in that interested him. And in a paper in 1912, uh, among many other references, Freud continues to apologize for his emphasis on sexual, um, sexualization or sexual theory. I think many people don't realize this. Freud's apology for his sexual interest um, was based on scientific grounds. That is that um, as we try to study something responsibly and carefully, we must increasingly limit this, our scope, limit our focus to define what exactly we want to look at. And in the early studies on hysteria, and I think as we go back and read those studies and listen to the material, we're aware that sexuality sort of um, leapt off the hypnotic and later the analytic couch. It was as though some people had not been dealing with it adequately, and it was something that interested Freud. Then I think to say also in his own uh, self-analysis, which uh, had its uh, main impact in about 1896, 1897, Freud began to view himself as the patient. That is, he had defined a model, a psychological model of hysteria. And at that point, Freud then started a process which has been continuing on ever since, which is in looking at an external model of hysteria, of a psychological basis, Freud started a dialogue with his own hysteria. He took himself to be the patient. He began to say, if certain threads, sexual and aggressive threads, are present there and produce those symptoms. What about my migraine headaches, which, he, well, he had severe headaches uh, at times, and also he had uh, train phobias, uh, which he traced back to uh, a trip that he took with his nursemaid uh, between 18 months and two years of age, and uh, some traumas that he had there, and they came out in his dreams. Most of this is recorded in his letters to his very close friend, um, um, William Fleece. As Freud began to tease out what he wanted to investigate, he chose the first person, personal pronoun, as his focus, I. The I. Unfortunately, in translation, it's translated into the Latin, not English, so that we have ego. And uh, uh, right now, Bruno Bettelheim, uh, among many others uh, that uh, knew Freud's work very well, have been uh, quite outspoken against the translators, feeling that some very important things were lost. That when Freud spoke about the I, there's a very different sense than when we now talk about the ego. Uh, 
by the time we talk about the ego, it's Latinized, it's like mechanical, it's like something that isn't me. Uh, but uh, in the original um, uh, German, the, the sense of I, the ego, is very personalized. So Freud was um, partly starting off from phenomenological basis of what I experience as I, but then he finally had a number of other ideas about it in the course of his work. Freud then began to separate out what is I from what is it. That is, what is not the I. And this has been translated also as the id, and in the course of time, we've tended to think of it as uh, something akin to biological instincts, which really is nothing that uh, Freud ever said. Um, that the, the it really represents, uh, or represented most of the time for Freud, that which cannot be taken into the I. And then, of course, in time, he had to deal with the social factors, the cultural factors, and he called that the forces of the upper I. Superego, it's been translated. Upper in the sense of the, like a bicameral house of legislature. And that is it over or above. So that there's something that, that has a different function, an, ex an executive function. In the history of psychoanalysis, then, this problem of the I, the self, has been dealt with in many ways, and I can't hope to do uh, justice to it today, except just to mention a few of them, which many of you have read in, in uh, various uh, courses. Um, the, the ego, as it was translated, began to take a very important focus in the work of Anna Freud in her 1936-37 uh, book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense. The ego is very well defined there, perhaps uh, more clearly than anywhere else. This gave rise to the work, uh, really, of the so-called ego psychologist, of which Heinz Hartmann, perhaps, is the most notable, Chris Lowenstein. The ego became gradually defined as a set of functions, perception, memory, motility, judgment, and a series of other uh, functions. In 1950, when Heinz Hartmann uh, wrote his classic uh, paper, uh, monograph, uh, trying to distinguish between the ego and the self, he did it on the following basis. He felt that whatever psychoanalysts have meant by the ego has had to do with a set of functions. Whereas the self, he preferred to call a central organizing center, or an organizing center, an integrative center. This particular distinction, which we continue to have to go back to and struggle with historically between a set of functions and an organizing center, the self, uh, in some ways has provided clarification to us. But in many other ways, has as, as, uh, posed problems that uh, have yet to be clarified. And in one place in my book, when I was uh, dealing with the, the self um, as an organizing center, um, I had to indicate that right now the, um, the ideas of self and ego get used interchangeably, often without being carefully defined. The assumptions or the ideas uh, associated with both ego and self are many times not clarified. And I think one of our goals this week, together as we go, is to try to see if we can have some sense of the various ways that self and ego have been used. And I believe each of our speakers this week, we're going to be in our own minds asking them, what do you mean by self when you say that? And what in assumptions does your idea, your notion of self or ego or I uh, entail? In what ways does that formulate problems for us? In which ways does it bring issues into focus, into greater clarity? And in what ways does it uh, raise further problems. So I think that that will be really the thread of inquiry probably that we'll be dealing with uh, for the week. As you know, Eric Erickson uh, spent a great deal of time around the same issue talking about identity. Uh, and when you read his works on identity, um, most of the time you could substitute the word in self and the sentences would read uh, just as well. Uh, Lick, and Lichtenstein uh, dealt with what he called primary uh, identity. John Ghetto at the Chicago Psychoanalytic uh, Institute talks about self-organization. And I'll mention him a bit 
later. He feels that, uh, unfortunately, because Heinz Kohart, who we'll also talk about later, has chosen to use the self in a very special way, that it's the self-organization that goes through development that we'll be interested in, in trying to follow. The key question of this symposium that Michael and I have been working on for about 10 years, and more intensively in the last three or four, but when Michael and I finally got together and said, we've got to do it, we've got to get our, our heads together and see if we can't bring some analysts and some philosophers together to see what ideas emerge from it, because these are not uh, at all clear. If I, can, if I can specify for you the problem, and for this discussion I'm going to use uh, Freud and Sartre in, uh, as the men wearing the black cloaks today, all right, the, the sinners in this particular problem. We continue to talk about, in psychoanalysis, and I think in philosophy as well, we continue to talk about the person, the mind, uh, people in general, as though we knew what we were talking about, as though it was fairly easy to define what a person is, which I, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, we're able to define the, uh, I think, the biological or the organic aspect of a person, but I'm not sure how successfully we've been at defining other aspects of personhood. So that when Freud and Sartre, to use only two examples, begin to talk and to formulate in various ways, they continue to assume that people are very much like themselves. And I think this is a difficulty that you're bound to have, say, in an academic um, a community, in a group of bright, well-integrated uh, people, continue to assume that the whole world of other persons functions very much like we do. Well, in a psychoanalytic situation, we begin to realize that, that is, that's not an assumption we can make, uh, because we begin to be exposed to people in a more intimate, more personal way um, than simply talking about them. So the problem that we begin to focus is, as we talk about self, ego, ego defenses, whatever, they may function in one way for one group of people that are fairly well-developed, well-differentiated individuals, but for another large sector of our population here, and certainly the clinical population in uh, therapy today, what comes into focus are other, I want to say, developmentally earlier notions about the self. And today I want to give you a brief survey of some of the ways in the last decade that psychoanalysts have come to conceive of self in contrast to other, and the way people at various developmental levels uh, define self and other. You're going to hear from me a great deal, and I, I suspect during other participants in the, um, in the symposium, of uh, the so-called developmental perspective in, in contemporary psychoanalysis. Uh, for those of you not familiar with that terminology, we're basically looking at, for the sake of a metaphor or a rubric, the first five or six years of life and the way in which a young uh, child gradually um, attains a sense of self. By the time we have a six or seven year old child who's well developed, they don't have too much question about who I am. Uh, it seems to be a fairly well settled and they don't have too much question about who the other people in their environment if we've had a, an average expectable uh, developmental situation. Many people have not been exposed to an average expectable developmental situation, and so they become stuck, or the word that we're now uh, using is limited or uh, developmentally arrested at earlier phases of the development of the self. On the long handout that I've given you, if you want to take a look at that, should I be using this podium? Is that... Um, I'll try this one, see if this is any better. If you look down, uh, down a ways, uh, or maybe let's look in the margin there, uh, the side margin. What I've given for you is sort of a schematic of the work of <coughs> Margaret Mahler. Margaret Mahler uh, first studied psychotic children and then uh, dyadic groups of mother-child combinations. And she came up with what is now uh, a very impressive schema uh, that uh, psychoanalysts uh, are referring to most everywhere. It's hard to read a book today without Mahler's work being referred to. Her view of development is somewhat different uh, from what we've been exposed to before. She feels that in the earliest phases of life, 
the earliest weeks, uh, there's a stage that she calls autism, that is that the child is primarily concerned not with what's outside, but rather with integrating and organizing internal, um, her word is co-anesthetic, uh, kinesthetic uh, sensations. Then uh, very rapidly, the child begins to become involved in what Margaret Mahler has called a symbiosis. Now, symbiosis uh, is a term borrowed from biology, um, a metaphor, to denote or to connote that state of affairs that we so often see between a young infant and a mother in which the two, from a psychological standpoint, operate as one. Um, how many times have we been in a room where uh, we're perhaps uh, socializing with uh, a mother and uh, the baby in the back room has awakened and we can begin to hear the cry, and we're sitting on the edge of our chairs saying, when is she going to take care of that baby? I mean, doesn't it want something? And the mother's sitting there as though she didn't hear a thing. And then all of a sudden, with one particular noise, she's up like a flash and in to get that baby. It's as though she has, and usually she alone, has some very definite sense of the timing and the need um, that that particular infant has. And of course, we know from the reports of mothers that uh, every child brings a different package with it into the world. And every mother-child combination turns out to be a very different interaction pattern. So I think this week, in our, uh, uh, much of our work, we're going to be referring to this particular developmental phase. And I want to alert you to some of the words so that you can uh, uh, keep track of it. This would be the phase that we've referred to as the symbiosis. The group of people that clinically get defined as borderlines or borderline personality organization are generally thought to be fixated with a sense of self that would be characterized at this level. That is, the sense of self in the group now being defined as borderline is a sense of self that's contingent upon a relationship with the mother-other. And I guess for our purposes also, when we talk about development, we have to use mother almost as a theoretical term, particularly now at this point in time and in Southern California where we have a great many people participating in the nurturing of um, uh, young children. So we know that uh, fathers and others are often involved, but I think we'll, for shorthand we'll be talking about uh, mother. I think there's an additional justification than uh, the shorthand for continuing to talk about mother. The additional one is one that's been observed many times in uh, the study of young children, which is that children tend to select or to go to one particular person during this symbiotic period, tend to want to form a relationship uh, of one person for their need satisfaction. This, was, this observation was first made by Anna Freud and Dorothy Burlingham in the Hampstead Nurseries during the Second World War. Uh, many young German girls had uh, fled to England and they opened the Hampstead nurseries and there were many children there, they were orphaned. And during this period, the second year of life really is our target from 8 to 18 months, if you will. Uh, during this particular period, these children regularly attached themselves to one caretaking person, although there were many available to them. And uh, there were many good ones, and so they, they didn't all attach themselves to one particular one, but each child seemed to need a special connection. Now, there's many ways of understanding this that perhaps we won't have time to go into today. Uh, my simplest way of uh, trying to grasp it is that in some way or another, the child is organizing thoughts, perceptions, sensations, and to, it's, imp it's a simpler task to be able to organize those in one environment that has a certain consistency. That is, we generally will notice that mother, whatever her nature is, her personality provides automatically a certain consistency. Her needs, her interests, her responsiveness provide a, a pattern, a regularity. And we tend to think that the symbiosis uh, is formed more easily with less difficulty is if there is a certain kind of regularity or patterns, regardless of the nature of that. So that every mother-child combination is idiosyncratic, but we, we feel that there's a certain sort of stabilization, a certain kind of mental organization that gradually differentiates out of the symbiotic matrix. Uh, as you can tell on that page, I'm going down the page. Uh, the, the first uh, one, uh, the first phase at the top, I've talked about the part self and the part object. That's in the earliest weeks and months. The second one is what I've been talking about, the so-called merger object or the symbiosis. The next phase down has been referred to as the um, 
phase of the self object. And this has uh, gradually gotten to be used as one word following the work of Heinz Kohut. This particular developmental period um, starts somewhere between the 18th and the 24th month as a rule. And we begin to notice in Mahler's language that the child um, has been fighting mother for a while, and the, uh, the, the, the fight begins at some point in the so-called terrible twos. The terrible twos is the mother's way, I think, of talking about um, what Margaret Mahler would refer to as the separation individuation process. When the child says no, when the child refuses to go along with uh, patterns, plans, and activities the way the mother wanted them. And we begin to feel that the no, the statement of independence, I don't want to do it the way you want me to do it, uh, that, that it, it can work into quite a battle, a battle of the bowels, I think many mothers have uh, called it, the terrible twos. But we realize that it is the ticket out of the very close, dependent, symbiotic relationship and into independent uh, selfhood. Some babies experience more of a negative period uh, than others. We begin to notice that many of the people we call borderline did not have a period called the terrible twos. Their mothers are aware that there was never such a struggle. Uh, and so they never took advantage of the ticket out or perhaps it was not possible for them to do it. Once the sense of independence has been established at a rudimentary level, Margaret Mahler says, there's another period. She calls it the rapprochement. You see it there in your margin. That is the reapproaching of mother. The rapprochement has been characterized um, as uh, the, the, the point at which the child senses there's a separateness between mother and me, and then reapproaches mother with a totally different attitude. And it's interesting, um, mothers have no trouble, by the way, with this concept. Uh, they, they know full well that a different quality of relatedness begins at some point. Suddenly the child approaches, mommy, 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 look. And it's like uh, all of the battle, all of the I don't want to, all of the I don't need you anymore has somehow begun to diminish in its impact. And suddenly mother is turned to, uh, in Coet's terminology, for mirroring. Mirroring of the nascent sense of self. That is, the sense of who I am and what I'm becoming needs to be consolidated, needs to take on a sense of psychological cohesiveness or coherence, and mothers know full well when this begins. They're very surprised because the child isn't fighting me anymore, but rather bringing me things to look at. Look how strong I am, look how well I can do this, uh, as this period may last for a while. Uh, look how strong I am, um, then it moves into the idealization of the parents. My daddy has a bigger car than yours, my daddy can beat you up. Uh, my mommy makes better dresses than yours does, my mommy makes better apple pie. So it has something to do with, and Kohut has uh, specified a series, series of phases and stages in here, in which through the relationship to the other, and in this case, we're talking more now about mothers and fathers because the child is relating more freely to many uh, people in the immediate environment, that in, um, in this way, the sense of self, we believe, is beginning to have a sense of, of cohesion. And it attains it at this level, according to our current theory, through the constant affirmations, confirmations of the parental self-objects. Self-object is Kohut's term. And the self-object idea is um, designed to acknowledge that the mother is related to as an object, other, by the way, in psychoanalysis, object is, 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 means other. I don't, it, it always has interested me how we've gotten so many impersonal terms in psychoanalysis, which you would think would be a very personal discipline. But when we talk about things, there's often impersonal terms. So object and other are more or less synonymous. The, the person is related to as an other, but used as an extension of the self, the body self, the mind self. That is, the child feels exhilarated as a result of confirmation which the child experiences from mother, father, whatever. As a sense of self, we think, begins to become cohesive, the child then moves on to the period, which I think has really been to my way of thinking, the developmental period that we have almost always considered, certainly the developmental period which was prominent in Freud's thinking, in Sartre's thinking, I believe. Although when we look at these major thinkers, they were always aware uh, 
that there were more primitive parts to the self or to the self and other relatedness. But by the time they begin to talk and formulate, it's as though the person that we're going to talk about, perhaps an adult, the assumption is always that the person has a well-developed sense of self and a well-developed sense of the separateness of others. As we've studied more and more in developmental psychoanalysis, we realize that this really doesn't occur until somewhere between the fourth and the eighth uh, years, uh, depending on the, the child and the developmental opportunities available. And that somewhere between the fourth and the eighth years, the child gradually begins to have a sense of certainty about who I am and have a sense of certainty about there are others in this world and their motivations are different from mine. So that to be able to distinguish what my needs are from others and to be able to recognize in the other there is a separate center of initiative, separate from my own. Now in Freud's original studies, of course, he referred to this as the Oedipal period based on the ancient myth and based upon his own uh, analysis, I believe. <coughs> the Oedipal period, I to my way of thinking, represents nothing more nor less than a developmental period in which a child studies triangulations in relationships. That is, the child begins to do some um, research into who I am with and without the other. So that if, if Ruth sitting here is uh, to be my mother and Kevin is to be my father, uh, the Oedipal child then tries to determine well, what, what is the nature of this relationship. And of course, the, the mythical uh, triangle of Oedipus is only one of perhaps a thousand different ways that a child could experience this emotional triangulation. They're contingent e emotional relationships. So that when I'm relating to my mother, I feel that I, I have one self and she has one self. And the minute he enters the room, something's happened. She's not the same anymore. And I notice I'm not the same anymore. And so then I'm having a good time with him, and she walks in and spoils all the fun. That is, he becomes different. He's more interested in her, or he's distracted by her. I find that I've got to deal with her. And then, of course, the so-called castration situation, uh, the sense of uh, personal uh, impotency that a child of this age becomes uh, aware of, which is when the two of them go in the bedroom and lock the door, and I feel quite injured by that. I feel left out. That, that is, that I'm aware that they have a relationship that is quite apart from what my needs for each of them are. So that I think if we consider the Oedipus situation in its broadest context, we're talking about the awareness that each other important person in my environment has a separate sense of self with its own motivational system and that in a way, other people's self-centeredness, narcissism, other people's self-investments are my enemies. That is that I am endangered by other people's needs, by what other people want from me. My sense of self uh, is, in, is potentially uh, endangered. I think then when we talk about personhood, we talk about people, we talk about psychoanalytic theory, whether from a psychoanalytic standpoint or a philosophical standpoint, an error that has been present throughout time and certainly still today in our literature is assuming that the people we're talking about have developed up to the Oedipal phase and that do have the capacity for the sense of separateness. Let me shift gears just a bit, because as we go on, we'll have plenty of opportunities to discuss, ask uh, uh, questions about these issues. Looking again at the format, I'd like now to shift to an area that has interested me. I'm not really shifting subjects, but shifting angles that I want to look at it. Already I've alluded to the problem that we assume the young child has in trying to differentiate and to distinguish whatever the sense of self is from whatever the sense of others are. In 1954, Edith Jacobson uh, published a classic paper, and she followed it up 10 years later in 1964 with a book. The, the titles of the paper in the book are the same, The Self and the Object World. Edith Jacobson studied particularly depression, severely depressed people. And she became aware that the structural topology left by Freud of id, ego, and superego were not helping her study depression 
that there were more that was more involved in that and she began to notice that the representations of self and the representations of others would provide a viable format for considering uh, depression so we'll have to skip over her ideas on depression and psychosis but i think that her the theoretical orientation is an important one. The next major important paper in this line of thinking, which we'll now call the representational world, or the world of self and object, or self and other representations, is a paper in 1962 by Joseph Sandler and Rosenblatt. Sandler and Rosenblatt were working at uh, the Hampstead uh, Clinic, as you know, Anna Freud's uh, clinic. Um, they weren't particularly interested in studying the superego in child psychotherapy. And they pu had published a paper the year before on the superego. The Hampstead Clinic, probably more than any other location really anywhere in the world, had at that time, and I guess still continues to have, an extensive research file on all the children taken there. That is, many child therapists practicing. They're all in child psychoanalysis. There's extensive workups in the case histories probably the most incredible research uh, database uh, in psychoanalytic studies that's available anywhere. They were interested in uh, how are references to the so-called superego implicit in how does the superego develop? And they went through thousands of protocols, thousands of therapist reports, uh, beginning uh, diagnostic studies, termination reports, and the astounding fact that they uncovered was that child psychotherapists don't use the word superego. And they thought, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Here are people who have been trained uh, at the most Freudian place in the world. Uh, they all know about ids, egos, and superegos. Presumably, these are helpful concepts in psychotherapy, child analysis. Why, why in none of the records does anybody deal with the superego? In trying then to answer that question, they had studied the protocols very carefully, and they felt that there were a number of, of issues. Uh, one was some people said, well, you really can't talk about the superego meaningfully until the person is well-developed, perhaps till a after adolescence, but that doesn't seem to do it. If we believe that the superego develops somewhere back in the Oedipal period, why can't we talk about it? The result of their study was an article, the 1962 article, on the representational world. They felt that the idea of the way a person experiences or represents the sense of self in contrast to the way that a person experiences or represents the sense of other was a very important line to begin to follow. Now, right now, there's some difficulty with uh, what is a representation. Uh, the bottom line in some way or another that it's a, a, a mental memory trace, but I don't think that helps us too much because we haven't quite decided what a memory trace is. So I think at this point we're stuck with a construct called a, a representation. Edith Jacobson in a footnote was very, uh, in her uh, 64 monograph was very quick to point out this is a metapsychological concept, concept. That is, phenomenologically we may be able to say I have, I have a representation of myself and I can tell you kind of what it is. I have a, con a self-concept or I have a concept of who my mother, or who my uh, friend, or who my lover, or whatever it is. Uh, that, again, doesn't help us too much when we're trying to do systematic consideration. I think we're stuck now just simply acknowledging that we have a construct, representation, that we, uh, there may be many ways to define it, and the question is, what is this, what, how does this construct help us? And I think you'll find, particularly in, in Robert Stollerow's uh, papers here on Friday and, and down at Costa Mesa on Friday, uh, you find that he has developed extensively the idea of self and object representations, and I'm certain that they'll be present in, in his talks. My book, which is on the back table, uh, if some of you want to uh, uh, purchase it, Michael's agreed to take a check from you. Uh, my book is organized along the line, following Edith Jacobson, along the line of self and object representations. An outline of my book is really what you have in, in your hands. That is, that I have thought it was very interesting in the psychoanalytic literature and in the clinical situation to trace, see if we could trace developmentally um, the line of self and object representations. From the first representations, which are presumably part objects, breasts, nipples, hands, fingers, thumbs, skin, blankets, whatever these part objects are, to the symbiotic object, my mother, to the self object, that 
person, my mother, father, brother, sister, who in some way or another confirm or reaffirm my sense of self, finally to the edifal uh, objects, the ones that are capable of uh, eliciting from me both love and hate, both affection and a fear. Now, as we go through the week, we're going to find that we're going to continue to have a contrast that will be important for you to keep in mind. The contrast will be between Oedipal level issues and so-called pre-Oedipal level issues. Now, in the graph that you have before you, you can see that it, I, I, I focus on three different pre-Oedipal constellations, or I call them listening perspectives because my work is, is primarily designed uh, to be made use of in uh, the clinical setting um, of psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. So I'm interested not so much in is there a, really a self or how can we know it. I'm far more interested in as I sit in my uh, analytic chair and someone is on the couch free associating, how can I listen to them? So my book is, for, is formed in the format of, of ways of conceptualizing the listening process as opposed to what is it that really is uh, there. Uh, Robert Stollero continues to contrast primarily the Oedipal and the pre-Oedipal. So as you hear that distinction made, you'll be aware that all three of the areas, the part self, the merger self, the self-object, all of these would, would come under the classification of the, of the pre-Oedipal. Let me then move to that particular distinction, Oedipal versus pre-Oedipal, because it's going to bring to me into focus, I think for us, a key question that we're going to be considering throughout the week. And at this point, we'll move to what was the original title or topic for this symposium, self-deception. Um, we expanded it so that people didn't feel quite so limited to that. But the issue of self-deception, I think, forms the heart of our discussions throughout these papers. What, what is meant by self-deception? Um, Herbert Fingerat, uh, as many of you know, wrote, I think, one of the more interesting monographs on the, on the problem of self-deception. In looking at the uh, Freudian doctrine of repression, which is assumed to occur sort of at the Oedipal period, Fingeret felt that Freud had cast the problem in the wrong, the question in the wrong terms. That is that Freud had cast the question in terms of the conscious and the unconscious. That is, what we're aware of or not aware of, he cast it in terms of knowing and not knowing. And in a very careful analysis, Fingeret felt that the question needed to be reframed. That is, we're, we know that there are a great many things in the course of a day that escape our attention or that escape our knowledge. And the issue, as I understand Fingeret uh, discussing it, is to what extent and under what circumstances are we either motivated or prevented from spelling out many aspects of ourself and our engagements with the world. That is, we engage with the world in many ways, and in some ways we're quite aware of it. That is, we spell it out in consciousness. We know certain things about ourselves because we tell ourselves certain things. But in other, in other areas, we seem not to spell these things out. And this would be the area, I think, that Freud wanted to include in his idea of uh, repression. The contrast that Michael and I have been working on for some time, um, let's see if I can give you the way that's formed. I would say to Michael, I said, well, Michael, I know all these, uh, I know the, the work on self-deception, and I know the doctrine, uh, uh, I know Sartre's idea fundamentally that there's a, an original project that one chooses to pursue, and that the focus of Sartrean analysis is trying to discover or to spell out in Fingeret's language, one's original project, that is one's engagements with the world, to be able to say what those engagements are or define them, spell them out in, in some way or another. And yet the, the group of people that we call pre oedipal particularly the group, the large group in clinical practice today that would come more in the symbiotic area, the borderline area, the question is, whatever it is that these people are doing, how can we say they're choosing it? And this was the way the question has formed in, in our dialogue. Um, and Michael would say, in some sense, I know it's a choice. And then I would say back, uh, 
Well, how can you say that an 18-month-old is making a choice? That is, he knows where his bread is buttered, his mother. And his mother is encouraging certain developments and either actively discouraging or failing to encourage other kinds of developments. That is, within the context of the early mothering relationship, certain skills, certain ego functions, certain senses are being fostered or systematically not fostered. And how then can we ca call that a choice? So Michael would say then again, well, I know there's a choice in some sense, but I, I hear what you're saying. So as we work this back and forth, uh, Michael and I have each found a different way of trying and to, to see if we can uh, formulate this problem. You'll hear his, uh, I'm sure, later. Um, I've tended to feel that it, I think it is important to retain the idea that at whatever age, um, something called choice exists so that if we have a borderline person, whether the problem is um, hyperactivity, alcoholism, obesity, whatever the particular symptom picture the person brings to the, the clinical setting, I think it's very important to assume that they are actively living out and that they are actively engaging in some way by choice that our life engagements are in some form formed by choice. And yet, on the other hand, we begin to realize that these people don't feel there's a choice. Um, they may be able to verbalize, I know I should stop eating so that I can lose 150 pounds, but I can't. Uh, so they don't experience it as a choice. And when we trace it back developmentally, it's as though it's a bit of a euphemism to say that an 18-month-old that, that uh, develops a certain commitment is a choice. And yet, I guess stated in its grossest terms, the choice is to keep a relationship with your mother or to lose it. And what child is in a position to make such a choice? So I think this is an issue we've got to tease out in our thinking. Uh, what do we want to call choice? And what do we want to call that in some way that this uh, way of living, the borderline scenario, as I've chosen to call it in my book, in what way is the borderline scenario uh, determined by early development? And then in what ways do we want to consider choice there? So we're going to be dwelling on that issue this week. The issue of self-deception then comes into focus. When we considered the Freudian doctrine applied to the Oedipal period of development, it, uh, stated very simplistically, it, it goes something this way, that the Oedipal level child is aware of certain impulses, instincts, if you will, uh, but impulses, towards the close people in his or her family environment. And that many of these impulses are quite unacceptable, or they become unacceptable to the child's developing sense of self, or the developing sense of the world. And so the child represses them. Now, repression has been, you, you know, many different metaphors have been developed for repression. But in some way or another, uh, it still seems to me kind of a magical concept as to how this occurs. And we're aware of repression primarily later from the clinical situation in slips and dreams when an idea or a representation or an impulse uh, suddenly appears and we're aware that the person on the couch doesn't want to own that impulse. Um, the example that springs to my mind is a, a man I'm working with now who had a, a a dream a few weeks ago. and The dream was very clear in terms of what he wanted. It happened to be a dream involving uh, the Pope. And it was very clear that he made a good connection to the Pope and to a man with a Catholic background. It was a very important thing to do. It was as though he felt blessed by the Pope in his dream. As he was discussing the dream, he suddenly realized my father was there, I was there, the Pope was there. Why wasn't my mother there? because the dream seemed to be an important dream for him. Then he became somewhat horrified because uh, he then had to begin acknowledging that he didn't want his mother as a part of this picture, that the beauty of this particular dream, the sense of cohesiveness that he felt with it, excluded mother. And then suddenly, he was horrified. I can remember seeing him squirm on the couch, and he burst into tears at one point. I want my mother dead. Now, this was quite an unacceptable thing. It was the first time he'd ever said such a thing. And who knows exactly how he wanted his mother dead. Uh, we have yet to work on this uh, some more. But in some very important sense, he said, this particular sense of fulfillment that I had with my father through the symbol of the Pope and the beauty and the pageantry of the Vatican and so forth, that was all a 
part of this dream excludes my mother. If she were to enter, she would just muck things up. Now, you see, he wasn't prepared prior to this time to realize how badly he wanted his mother out of the picture. Now, this is a well-developed man. I think in uh, at other periods, we're going to find it reworking the other way in which his father will be excluded or his sister or his brother or whatever. But this particular motif, there's an unacceptable thought. I want my mother dead. So the idea then of repression, as classically conceived in analysis, is that there are unacceptable impulses that in some way or another have been relegated, repressed, to the unconscious system. Now, as we begin to study the so-called population of borderline, or the pre-Oedipal groups, we begin to see that repression doesn't quite work in this way. The clinical phenomena, which I can report to you, that all therapists will readily tell you as soon as they've had a few patients that we might call borderline, is that there, uh, there seems to be no unconscious. That is, it's all there. The borderline person, uh, in, in the simplest sense, walks into the hour and begins talking about all sorts of things that you know, we would think would be reserved for several years of close, intimate contact. But suddenly, they're there at the very beginning. It's as though there is no repression. It's as though whatever Anna Freud meant by defenses don't work for this particular group of people. Robert Stollero will be alluding to this in a brilliant book that he put out in 1981 called The Psychoanalysis of Developmental Arrest. Stollero pursued to me one of the most interesting theses, I think, in contemporary psychoanalysis. His thesis was basically that it makes sense at the Oedipal level to talk about defenses, ego defenses, in the way that Anna Freud and the ego psychologists always have. But at pre-Oedipal levels, it doesn't make sense. That is, whatever the defensive process, that is the part that wants to repress, that wants to keep out of awareness, out of a consciousness, that wants to keep from crystallizing into verbalization, whatever that is, it seems to be sometimes present, sometimes absent with our pre oedipal people, but it's not a consistent, reliable phenomenon as it is with neurotic people who have gotten to the uh, Oedipal level. Or neurotic, in, I guess, in psychoanalysis, we have to assume always is a another word for normal. That is, the assumption in psychoanalytic theory, for some of you, is that the universal condition of uh, man is to, in, in given favorable developmental conditions, is to move to the Oedipal period so that normality and Oedipal neuroses are more or less uh, synonymous. The question about whether one wants treatment or whether it seems terribly neurotic, we're going to use that word, is really a question of degree or extent or subjective discomfort. The pre oedipal people, then, the, the borderline people, uh, continue to present us with paradoxes. Otto Kernberg, in his 1975 book on borderline conditions, reported this phenomenon. He said, again and again, someone would come to the therapy situation, and with clarity, one day, they would tell me something. And it would be clear and moving and emotional. The following day, they would come in and tell me something quite contradictory. And he said, I would become puzzled. And I would put the problem to the patient. I'd say, well, now, I heard what you just said, blah, 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 blah. But yesterday, you told me something quite different. You told me blah, 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 blah. And the patient would say, well, yes, it's true. I told you that yesterday. But that was yesterday. Today, what I want to tell you is, without any particular um, emotional impact around the issue of the contradiction. And we see this in our so-called borderline patients every day. That is, that there is one, if you will, frame of mind or state of self present at one temporal moment and quite a different sense or state of mind, uh, storyline, if you will, present at a different moment. And sometimes it depends on the mood the person is in. Sometimes it depends largely on external circumstances, which of many or multiple senses of selves or experiences of others are occurring. The term that uh, is now the rage in psychoanalysis for this phenomenon is splitting. It gets used in a variety of ways, splitting of the ego. But splitting would be a way of conceptualizing this process in a pre-Oedipal focus. That is, if repression is a way of taking from the so-called conscious level and relegating it to the unconscious, splitting is a way uh, of a vertical split rather than a horizontal, to where in one frame of mind or one state of consciousness, one sort of material is available, but in another frame of mind or another state of consciousness, quite a different uh, one. And the splitting often, uh, from a clinical standpoint, we see the splitting along lines of, of goods and bads.
of highs and lows, of uh, euphoria versus depression. So that uh, sometimes it's, it's on a content basis, sometimes it's on an affect basis, but the good and bad uh, mother, the good and bad, bad self, tend to be the, uh, at least what's being expressed now, uh, within the psychoanalytic community. So that at this pre oedipal level, the sense of self-deception is quite different. That is, parts of the self are not usefully considered as being unconscious, but perhaps they have to be reconceptualized in terms of more or less conscious at different times according to different variables that might be operating at that point in time. I'd like to restate what I just said for, for clarity, for, because I think it's a, an issue. In extending the notion of self-deception downward developmentally from the Oedipal period of development, it seems useful to reconceptualize what we're talking about. That is, as advanced stages of psychic development, that is, a child who's had favorable developmental circumstances up to the ages of five and six, the repressive phenomena are fairly readily observable. But when we go down the developmental ladder to areas of personality that have not matured to that level, repression doesn't seem to be a good way of accounting for what we see, what we hear. Splitting is the word that's currently used, and I think we've got to develop it in many other ways. That is that whatever deception is involved is not a deception between consciousness and unconsciousness. It has to be a deception conceptualized on some other level. I'll be alluding to this somewhat in my paper tomorrow, perhaps in even a, a clearer fashion. <laughs>